local labor, so when archaeologists actually hire local community members to be their labor force. And archaeology has a long history of having very massive labor forces, um, hiring multitudes of people from in and around uh, archaeological sites to conduct the, the physical labor, the actual um, digging work and often the sifting and sort of these like physical um, uh, difficult tasks uh, of the archaeological process. Uh, so the photo um, at the top left, that's Orr, uh, Leonard Woolley's excavation. That's Mortimer Wheeler at Mahenjo Daro. And this photo up at the top right is actually from the movie The Exorcist, um, which I include um, because this is the image of archaeology that we portray and, and, that, and that is popular and that is actually not far off from the truth. And this is like an image of archaeology that carries. Um, so we have this long tradition of hiring massive labor forces from the places where we excavate. And often, people are hired generation over generation over generation, uh, like Mary was talking about in a very different region. Um, but in the Middle East, we have, we have these entire villages where people become experts in archaeological excavation because of being hired over and over and over again. So one of my favorite examples, and the one that really got me into my field of research, uh, is Sutton Lloyd's quotes, or sort of extended discussion in Mounds of the Near East, where he refers to our invaluable Shirkati experts, uh, referring to the the, the, the villagers of a village named Shirkat in Iraq, uh, where they were hired for um, several years and ultimately ended up designing their own tools uh, to delineate mud brick um, and were hired by multiple excavations uh, over and over again um, and really became known for their expertise in excavation. And Sutton Lloyd here is actually talking about how he himself learned how to excavate from the Shirkatis there. But these people who uh, engage in the physical labor of excavation are very often not credited. This is a hard thing to find an image for. It's hard to find images of people not receiving credit. Um, but very often uh, the team will be sort of acknowledged either in the abstract, in the acknowledgments, um, almost never by name, um, and certainly not in the same ways that uh, research team members uh, or traditionally, people who are considered to be part of the research team would be credited. Um, so this labor is, is invisible in some sense. Um, I had to go digging a bit for the pictures that I showed you. The Shirkati mention is, is um, in the middle of this kind of extensive memoir about archaeology in the Middle East. So these mentions that I am pointing out to you are really just that. They're really mentions. They're not um, uh, wholesale acknowledgments of, lo of local contributions to the production of archaeological knowledge. And what I'm going to argue is that that's not an accident. It's the result of a particular historical process and specifically the shifting grounds of archaeology of the 19th and 20th centuries. And so I want to ask these questions and hopefully answer them. What are the shifting grounds that have rendered local archaeological expertise invisible? And what will be required to see it again? Um, so the Shirkatis are not the only experts uh, that, that I'm looking for or trying to um, make uninvisible, make visible again. Uh, there's a long history of these groups of people in the Middle East um, who are identified as archaeological experts. Um, so one of the more recent ones uh, is in Koptos, uh, where George Reisner worked from 1900, well, he worked there for a while, but from 1900 to 1904, um, he was training uh, the local community, members of the local community there. And even 50, 50 years later, um, in publications by people like William Albright, uh, these, these, these field workers are considered really the best in the business, and you are considered to be doing good scientific archaeology if you hire the field workers uh, trained by George Reisner. Um, this photo is actually taken by Saeed Ahmed, who was his foreman. Um, so Saeed was uh, trained in photography, also other forms of documentation. And before George Reisner would go to a new site, he would often send Saeed Ahmed ahead and ask him to start the excavation on the first few levels. Um, so these trained field workers are recognized as almost um, like one of the conditions for good scientific archaeology in the Middle East uh, during the mid-20th century. A decade before Reisner worked at Koptos, 
Uh, Petrie was employing people from the village of Kuft, um, it's the same area, who also became well known in the, in the archaeological community as a reliable pool of labor. Um, he also entrusted some of his workers with recording tasks like drawing sections or scale plans. Um, and in fact today, New York University's excavation at Abidus still hires the descendants of the, of the workers that uh, Petrie trained um, originally. Uh, and actually during this conference, merely 48 hours ago, uh, Sarah Parkak tweeted that uh, her favorite part of fieldwork is delineating mud brick and that she enjoys doing it with the Kuftis who are true excavation experts. So these, these people are still recognized today um, as, as experts in archaeology. But maybe the earliest example, one of, certainly one of the most interesting examples of uh, local archaeological experts is Hormuz Drasem, who was uh, Layard's F a foreman, a kind of right-hand man uh, for his excavations in Nimrud. Um, and initially, Rasam was brought on to kind of help navigate local politics, to kind of grease the wheels, that kind of thing. Um, but he became so knowledgeable about archaeology that he started independently leading excavations himself. Um, and ultimately, when Layard stopped doing excavations, the British Museum asked Rasam to take over. Um, he even published his own memoir of his journeys and archaeological work, much like Layard and, and uh, their contemporaries. Um, but not in his lifetime nor afterwards has Rasam really been recognized as a scholar in his own right. Um, from the 1890s unto the, into the present, uh, he's often characterized as just a digger, and the kinds of mistakes uh, that are that are just kind of a, a just a natural fact of excavations in the 19th century are blamed on him particularly, even though he was using uh, methods that were normal for the time. Uh, Petrie, uh, his relationship with the Kuftis was not um, altogether positive. Um, he was known for being very racially um, oriented and how he hired workers. He, would, uh, he, he writes in one of his texts about the need to check workers' teeth and to make sure that they're going to be good workers, and uh, it's pretty, pretty disturbing. Um, he was also known for intentionally bringing workers from elsewhere to dig at an archaeological site, so the Kuftis he would often bring to Palestine, and then he also had a trained labor force in Palestine that he would bring to Egypt because he didn't want them to feel like they had any sort of uh, claim to the objects that they were uncovering. And then uh, Reisner um, has this whole kind of like uh, catalog of letters that he sent to James Henry Breasted about how um, he needed to save the workers that he was training from themselves, expressing these very patriarchal notions um, and expressing a lot of disdain for these men. And so I'm, I'm highlighting these examples because they are, ex they are examples of recognized archaeological expertise, but these, they are not recognized as archaeologists by any means. Um, and the thread of colonialism and orientalism still is like structuring these encounters from the beginning. Um, so their, their recognition as archaeological experts is um, limited by uh, these um, historical and political conditions of the time. Um, but moving into the 20th century, I think that that erasure that begins with colonialism and orientalism is enhanced and augmented by uh, the shift towards positivism and empiricism um, in archaeology. So that trend towards scientization over the course of the 20th century, uh, we see the implementation of a number of tools and technologies that make it so that anyone can dig. Uh, it's, it's partly, I think, considered democratizing, partly considered um, to be a shift towards um, objectivity. The idea that anyone can dig, anyone can use the same uh, recording strategies, the same excavation strategies, and the same results will come out. Mary Nutt was talking about this kind of belief in universal techniques um, in her talk as well. Um, and the, and that, that emerges over the course of the 20th century. And so we have things like the Wheeler Kenyon method with the, you know, the box and the grids that we're all familiar with. Um, the emergence of pre-printed context sheets, um, which are kind of meant to be used by anyone. And there's been a fair amount written about this, uh, that, that, that these um, shifts in how we do archaeology were, were intended to um, systematize the process. Um, but we know from, uh, from, from work that lots of folks have done, including Matt Edgeworth and others, um, 
uh, Joan Giro, lots of people, that who dig actually really matters a lot. And um, a lot of the papers at this conference as well have really slowed down the interactive, dialogic moments that lead to the production of archaeological knowledge. So we know that, pr that producing scientific knowledge is um, between people, it's interpersonal, it's interactive, and power dynamics matter a lot. Um, th this, it is not like the kind of objective process that a lot of these tools and techniques imagined uh, the process to be. Um, and so more recently, there's been, I think related to this recognition that um, different people have different perspectives and different things to say about the archaeological process, different important things to contribute, there's been another shift, another shift in grounds towards community and public archaeology, um, which is now, I think, probably an entire subfield, we could probably agree. Um, it has its own journals, it has its own professional societies, it has its own degree programs. Uh, this is a surprising thing to say in the States, but I think uh, to this audience, maybe less so, um, has special tracks at artwork conferences. Um, and so this shift towards community and public archaeology has promised in a lot of ways to, um, to break down uh, any barriers between scientists and non-archaeologists and to allow um, for dialogic perspectives on the past. Um, and so the question that I went into the project that I'm going to present asking was whether that's had any impact on the recognition of local archaeological expertise. Does, the, do, does this shift towards community and public archaeology, does that undo the long-term history of colonialism, orientalism, and scientization that I think have all contributed to rendering local archaeological expertise invisible? And so to figure this out, I undertook a comparative project. I worked at two sites uh, for about seven years, um, at Çatalhöyük in Turkey, well-known Neolithic site, uh, known for its sort of progressive and reflexive methodologies, and then also the Temple of the Winged Lions in Petra, Jordan, uh, not of the same period, a pre-Roman site, capital of the Nabataean Kingdom. Um, so the, my interest in comparing these two projects was not in uh, the similarities between the archaeological materials, but in the similarities between their histories. So both sites were first excavated in the mid-20th century, uh, Chattelhook beginning in 1961 by James Mellard and Temple of Wing Lions beginning in 1974 by Philip Hammonds. Um, both Mellard and Hammonds did not record their, the names of the workers that they employed. Um, Mellard hired a, a few dozen workers from the adjacent villages and Hammond hired an estimated total of about 300 Jordanian men um, for his projects project. Uh, and then both, both of these projects have been reopened recently um, with the Chattelhook Research Project beginning in 1993 and then a, a renewed uh, community-based uh, project at the Temple of the Lions in, t in 2012. Um, and so we see kind of similar uh, excavation histories at these two sites, um, kind of complementary excavation histories at both sites. So from um, the recent excavations at Chatel and the older excavations at Petra, I have very long-term archives uh, and a large body of people to interview and interact with um, to understand how they experienced these two sites. Um, so I'm focusing on those two periods with the awareness that, that uh, there was an earlier excavation at Chatel and there is a more recent excavation at the Temple of the Winged Lions. Um, and my goal is to unpack whether this older, older model of archaeology and this older way of interacting with the local community, which was really embodied by the Hammond Project, um, is led to um, different knowledge production outcomes and different involvements of the local community than the more recent uh, Chattelhook Project, which is known for um, involving community engagement uh, as a kind of core part of its methodology. Um, and so, just to illustrate what it, why I'm comparing these two and how they were different, um, I interviewed uh, former site workers from the Temple of the Winged Lions and then went through site notebooks uh, from this project. Um, and what I find is that these two records overwhelmingly agree um, that this was an extremely hierarchical project, very traditionally run, um, and that the relationships between the foreign excavators and the, and the Bedouin site workers were pretty fraught. Um, so so at one point there was a strike uh, by the site workers for more pay um, and then the, one of the authors of the site notebooks refers to the group of people striking, <laughs> engaging in collective bargaining, bargaining as the kitty brigade, um, which doesn't 
feel great. Um, and then the site workers would say things like this quote that uh, Hammond saw the people as slaves. Um, some people said goats, that they, he wouldn't allow them to have water breaks, that he um, would fire them for being even a minute late. Um, so there's lots of stories about those really fraught relationships um, between the groups of people uh, at the Temple of the Winged Lions that contrasts quite a bit with the experiences of work at, at Chattelhook, uh, where the diary entries illustrate, in general, quite positive and uh, mutually respectful relationships between the workers and uh, the foreign excavators. So uh, this excavator, CLC, um, calls the worker that she is working with Usta, which means ma master or master workman. Um, she says it's nice to see him enjoying contributing to the work and also others appreciating his contribution and his skill. And then a site worker that I interviewed uh, reflected on being trusted with a, re a recording task, um, writing down the labels on the archaeological finds, something that wouldn't normally be uh, entrusted to a local worker at most sites, and so he felt included in the work. Um, so obviously these are, these are kind of anecdotal examples. I've chosen them because they're illustrative. Um, and elsewhere I've shown that this really does reflect the archive uh, in general. Obviously it, it was not 100% positive and rosy at Chattel Hook and it was not always antagonistic and terrible at the Temple of the Winged Lions. But I want to characterize kind of the, the feeling, the interpersonal aspect of these, uh, these contrasting labor management strategies at the two sites. Um, so with that scene set, I want to return to the question of how we see local archaeological expertise again. So one of the themes that has come up in this, in this conference is how do we study the production of archaeological knowledge, how do we study it in a changing environment. Um, and so I use two techniques to look at how local archaeological expertise is working in these two contexts. One is uh, the eth ethnographic approaches. Um, where I was engaging in participant observation, uh, especially at Chattelhook, also at Petra, doing interviews, uh, kind of the watching uh, knowledge production unfold, um, all of that. And then I also use uh, network analysis. I think that um, I do not want to make the argument that the trend towards positivism and empiricism was what erased archaeological labor, and so the way we get out of it is by throwing that aside and casting that aside. Um, I think that we should embrace uh, what archaeology's um, uh, appreciation for scientific methodology has given us um, and use structural and visual and quantitative um, strategies to our advantage to make uh, the arguments for um, how archaeology should work uh, that we want to make. Um, and I think that that uh, has come out in a lot of the papers over the course of these few days as well, that, um, that, that visualization is really important and that like doing good math matters, uh, having good data matters a lot. Um, so I'm going to show the network analyses that I produced. I, I, I will explain them. Um, I like them for being this structural view. Uh, I think that they map out who holds what kind of knowledge really well. Um, and so I've broken the way that I do network analysis up into three sections. The first one is looking at archaeological finds and what the foreign team members knew about archaeological finds or know about archaeological finds versus what the local team members uh, knew and know. So these are the networks that I produced. Um, you can see right at the outset that the Chattelhook network is much denser, much more populated. Um, this is 20-ish uh, years of um, people producing diary entries and archive reports. Um, and I mined all of those records for mentions of any, any artifacts at all. So if I was an excavator and I said, oh, I found bone today, uh, that would be a link uh, to everyone else who ever mentioned bone. I would be in this network with a link to all those people. Um, and then likewise, I did it with the oral history interviews that I did. So anyone who mentioned bone would also be linked to everyone else who mentioned bone. Um, the TWL project was, uh, had, had a smaller number of individuals um, and has a smaller archive, uh, so it's, it's not as dense at the outset. But the nice thing about network analysis is that there are um, statistics that, that are appropriate to use even when your networks are of different sizes or different densities. Um, I, I won't get too, too deep in the weeds about the math. I'm happy to do, do that later if you want. But what I think we should notice right away uh, is that um, in the Chattelhook network, the blue dots, I don't know how well you can see with this, these colors, but um, the site workers who are in blue are really scattered throughout the whole network. Uh, and so I'll go a little bit later into what that means, but um, they're not 
there's no any measurement you do, the site workers come out kind of positioned similarly to the archaeologists uh, in terms of the, the things they know about the archaeological finds. Um, with the TWL project, it's quite different. So you see the archaeologists as this kind of central clustered bubble, and the site workers are quite literally all around the periphery. And so I'll explain kind of what that means and, and how that turned out. Um, in general, uh, the archaeologists were talking about a lot of the same artifacts over and over and over again. So they're drawn together at the center of the network. Um, the site workers, though, often had very detailed, very interesting information about um, particular archaeological finds. So they have fewer connections to different kinds of artifacts, which pushes them out towards the outskirts. But I still argue that they have something to contribute. So. Um, one example that I, uh, that I like to talk about is a man named Nawaf who I interviewed who told me about a falcon that he remembered finding. Um, and I really was confused. I didn't, I'd gone through all of the archives from this project. I didn't remember any mention of a falcon. He said it was a big falcon from the roof. And I said, well, was it complete or broken? He said, no, it's complete. And he showed me a picture on his phone of his friend uh, hunting with, a I think, a peregrine falcon. Um, and he was like, it was the, the same size. And so I combed back through the archives, uh, the site notebooks from this, the years that Nawaf had worked. And I found this mention, uh, bronze eagle in the earthquake wall, 60 centimeters from Western Bulk under the northern bulk, and that is it. That's all the information we have about this artifact in the site notebooks. And so Nawaf's memory adds uh, detail, both like kind of um, interesting detail, but also like scientifically really important detail that is not recorded in the original archive. Um, and so that's what I think is being um, illustrated by the network analysis of, of, of the artifacts that at Chattel Hook, the site workers had um, access to seeing lots of different kinds of artifacts, remembered finding lots of different kinds of artifacts. At TWL, uh, they were sort of um, uh, ex excluded from a lot of aspects of the project, and so what they remember is detailed, but it is less uh, comprehensive from the project. Um, I've done a similar network analysis with methodology as well. So I looked at who mentioned what kinds of methodologies. And at TWL, you'll notice uh, that the archaeologists, again, form this clustered central group where the site workers are literally and mathematically per peripheral. Um, at Chattel Hook, it, it initially looks like the site workers are kind of um, like clustered along this, like, this outer ring. Um, but I've run a, 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 an algorithm um, called modularity on, on both of these networks, but it's more interesting for the Tadalhuyuk one, which sorts your network into groups. It says if you were to cut up uh, a bunch of the links and create distinct groups, how many distinct groups would be ideal to create uh, that would break the least amount of links, uh, and what would those groups look like? Who would be in those groups? And so when I ran that algorithm, it optimized at seven modularity classes, um, and the site workers were in six out of seven of them. And so I looked harder into the modularity classes, which again are kind of groupings, subgroupings within the network, natural subgroupings within the network, a network based on knowledge of, of methodology. And when I looked at who was in the modularity classes, I found that they mapped really well onto different kinds of methodological expertise, where modularity class zero were people who knew about a lot of different kinds of methods. Those were the generalists. Um, the second group were people who remembered really particular strategies that we don't use very often at Chattel Hook, like arbitrary layers in this example. Um, modularity class three was all about burials. Modularity class four was all about excavation. Five was experimental archaeology. Uh, and six was about measurement. Um, but so they, so they, ma they mapped into the same subgroups that the overarching team mapped into. And so my argument is that the local workers at, at Chattel Hook formed a subgroup that looks like the overarching group in terms of specialty. So we have subcommunities of specialists within the local archaeological team, the local, the local site workers, that looks a lot like uh, what the overall group looks like. We've done... Uh, maybe a good job at Chattel Hook of, of passing on particular interests and of maybe fostering particular um, pa uh, passions among the people that we've hired. But I am not going to praise uh, Chattel Hook too much. There is definitely a limit to the scope of expertise that site workers develop, even on a project like this that prioritizes community engagement and that I think has had really clear effects. 
So when I develop the same network analyses based on interpretation, and I use interpretation honestly pretty loosely, like anything that was a step removed from naming a, a, a find itself uh, got you in the interpretation network. So things like why was the site abandoned? How was it built? Uh, how did these people die? Things like that was all under the category of interpretation. And what you might notice right away is that uh, the TWL network is sparse. It's like a really bad spider web. Um, and that's because, honestly, it, at the, on the TWL project, the site workers nor the, the foreign team members were encouraged to um, engage in, in interpretation on the site. Uh, TWL, remember, starts in the 70s, right in the thick of this move towards scientization. And so the archive notebooks, the site notebooks that I have, are extremely uh, structured and systematized and rigid. Um, and so the TWL pro project uh, just doesn't have a lot of um, interpretation in the records that I was looking at, and certainly the workers were not involved in it. Um, but at Chattel Hook, the site workers this time actually are quite peripheral. Even when you run measures like centrality that actually statistically measures uh, how peripheral they are, the site workers are out, pushed out, out, out to the outskirts. Um, and when I talked to them, the Chattel Hook site workers said they wanted to know more about the findings of the project, but for a lot of reasons felt blocked from accessing this information. Uh, they described an artifact maybe being lifted by trowel and a bunch of archaeologists speaking English and crowding around uh, the artifact and then it gets bagged up and labeled and sent down the hill and then locked in a lab that they physically cannot enter. Um, the site worker might be friends with some people on the project but uh, either lacks the language or isn't on site at a time uh, when that artifact is being examined and so they just they often just didn't know what happened to things once they were uh, down the hill or, or outside of their immediate scope. Um, so there's a host of all kinds of barriers working to prevent site workers from participating in interpretation of the material, even at a site like Chattel Hook. Um, there's issues of etiquette, there's issues of um, hierarchy and disrespect, that issue of presence or absence of friendship, and so all of this blocks the transmission of ideas, but not just from archaeologists to site workers, but also from site workers to archaeologists. Um, although I was often talking to site workers about their experiences of blockades from learning from archaeologists, very often uh, I found that the site workers felt like they had something to give back to the archaeologists as, as well and wanted to participate in that conversation. Um, so both sites have these blockades to site workers being involved in the full range of things that characterize the excavation. Um, and this takes a, different forms in the two different contexts. At Petra, uh, what I found was that people would tell me stories over and over and over again um, about being at about asking for either either more information or offering their own expertise. Um, and if they came up to an archaeologist and tried to kind of uh, engage in an intellectual conversation, um, they would get pushed back. So this conversation was with a man named Ahmed who uh, described a time, described his feeling of not wanting to participate in any more archaeological excavations. He said, I'm done. I don't want to work with you archaeologists anymore. And I said, why? And he says, well, you know, I I'll go to one site and you'll dig up a bowl and you'll say it's Iron Age and then I go to another site and you dig up the same exact bowl and you say it's Bronze Age and I say, uh, I'm pretty sure that's Iron Age. Um, and so I asked him, well, like, what happens, what happens when you say, well, I think this is actually um, different than what you're thinking. And he said, if you say that, they will say, no, we are right, we're the experts. And if you're a worker and you come all the time to ask them, they might, they'll become angry, you know, and they'll say, stop. Uh, we only brought you here to work, you're not here to ask. Um, and so uh, Ahmed was one of a group of people who claimed that they had no archaeological expertise, but then would also, also tell me very detailed information about um, archaeological finds, about Iron Age versus Bronze Age bowls, or about how far down you have to dig until you find the destruction layer at Petra, or about Nabataean fineware um, and what it would have been used for. Um, but he says that they, get, they would get fired or uh, demoted or punished in some sort of way if they would raise that, uh, that, that sort of critique um, or, that, or, or even just question. Um, and so this is a phenomenon that I'm going to call lucrative non-knowledge. I'll define it in a second. Um, but I'm, it's basically the process by which knowledge is, is made um, uh, financially precarious. It's, it's expensive to claim expertise um, or financially damaging. It happens at Chattel Hook too, and this is really like 
kind of the, the surprising find uh, f from my research is that the people I spoke to at Chattel Hook who would also who also clearly have demonstrable expertise they know about the same artifacts uh, as the recorded archive they have methodological insight and methodological specialties um, they would still say that they didn't have any expertise just like the people in Petra so both of the people that I spoke to claimed that they didn't have any expertise um, but the people at Chattel Hook when I spoke to them would say that they knew about things like grinding grain or baking bread. Um, they say that they know, uh, one man said, I know about these things from my childhood. I've lived them. I'm not learning anything by working here. People in the village, we can teach archaeologists about ovens and how to heat the houses at Chattel Hook. We live the same way as the Neolithic people. I got quotes like, I am the daughter of the Neolithic, I am one of the Neolithic people. Um, so the people at Chattel Hook were emphasizing their sort of um, primitivity or traditionalism honestly in their language this sort of like anti-modern identity um, in, instead of a scientific knowledge even though I set out to document and illustrate that they had scientific knowledge and I think successfully did so uh, they denied having it they kept saying that they were Neolithic people and that was really where their expertise uh, lay um, and at Chattel Hook, I think this comes from um, the fact that uh, over the 90s and 2000s, there were a number of ethno-archaeology and experimental archaeology projects that uh, site workers were paid to participate in. There were also a number of documentaries that came through that would hire people from the local community to act out uh, being Neolithic. Um, and so it, it has become financially uh, beneficial to them at Chattel Hook to embrace this uh, kind of traditionalism and, and really lay claim to that that um, that like Neolithic supposedly Neolithic identity, um, whereas they actually have a lot of like re very real scientific expertise, um, even though they deny that that's true. So I think for very different, well maybe not very different, but for different, slightly different reasons, um, at both sites, even at Chattel Hook, which has emphasized community engagement, which um, says, uh, which has like I think set set the agenda for progressive methodology for a long time, or, or did, um, at both sites there is this phenomenon that I'm calling lucrative non-knowledge, in which it's more financially beneficial to pretend to lack skill or expertise rather than to demonstrate or lay claim to it, whereas at Petra, that's because you're going to get fired for saying, oh, I think I, think I know better, I think maybe you should dig over here, I think maybe um, that's, that's, that, that ring isn't ancient, whatever. Um, that that is like a precarious position to put yourself in and at Chattel Hook there's just more benefit to be gained by saying like oh, I'm just a simple traditional villager um, I'm gonna hug my sheep that kind of thing um, and so this is a like this is a pervasive phenomenon it's in place at two very different sites in two different countries um, with different but related archaeological histories at like a inter international level um, and so the challenge is how do we see local archaeological expertise again I want to return to this question um, and I think the answer is that it requires a really hard look at what we're actually paying people to do, what we're expecting, what labor we're expecting in return for the, the money that we give. Um, and so I ran some experiments at both Petra and Chattel Hook, very small scale experiments, um, but I offered the local workers um, the, a camera. I said, would you like to document um, the things that you experience in your day-to-day -day life? And at both sites, it, this was really eagerly embraced. Um, at Chattel Hook, they just asked me, would we have to pay for the camera if we break it? <laughs> and I said, no, of course not. Um, so, uh, so it seemed like something that, that people wanted to participate in, they were excited to participate in. And I think it was really effective at um, capturing the kind of expertise that I have demonstrated exists in these two places. So at Petra, um, the four participants in the photography experiments produced four very different kind of categories um, of uh, documentation, of photographic documentation, that looks really, really different from um, traditional archaeological documentation. So Aguila was this, was, would repeatedly take pictures looking out from the archaeological site, really carefully documenting documenting its surroundings. Um, Bassam would document uh, these, like, he was like a special events photographer. This was like a, um, a school day that we had at the site. Um, Shocker took exclusively selfies. I think I have 89 selfies uh, from Shocker from the days that he had the, the camera. Um, and then Ahmed was actually the only one who was reticent to use the camera. Um, but then one day he was like, give me the camera, give me the camera. So I gave it to him uh, and he documented 
um, I guess it's kind of cut off in this in this photo, but there's um, a bulldozer uh, over here on the great. This is the Great Temple in Petra. There's a bulldozer there, and he said that area is very weak. Uh, we need to take pictures and send them to the authorities because they shouldn't be using bulldozers there. So he kind of used it as like a policing tool um, to like from what he knew about that site. Um, and so we have like four very distinct categories of um, I think really important documentation that pushes the photographic archive in uh, new and different directions from kind of the traditional scientific photography and archaeology of kind of clearing out the, the context and um, you know taking photos from above. We have these very contextual photographs that illustrate really different expertise uh, from each of these individual people. And I think that maps onto the expertise that I think that has been shaped by the way that projects are run in Petra. And I ran the same experiments at Chatel and c came up with totally different uh, results. So at Chatel, remember, I'm arguing that the expertise is much more similar to the expertise that archaeologists have. Um, and what I found was that they produced photos that mapped like pixel for pixel almost onto, uh, onto photographs in the Chattel, in the Chattelhook Photographic Archive. Um, so uh, in this photo, um, this photo is by a man named Hussein who's worked at Chattelhook for many years. Um, and this photo is by our project photographer, Jason Quinlan. Um, and they are so similar uh, from the angle and the, and the composition. They're really, really quite similar. The same is true down here. Um, this, uh, this photo was taken collaboratively uh, by two of the site workers. Um, and this one is by our site, our site photographer, uh, Jason Quinlan. Um, and they are like kind of opposing angles, but the same site, the same sort of focus. Um, and so we see uh, the site workers expressing that scientific expertise through photography that they were uncomfortable with expressing um, another way to me, at least verbally. Um, in some ways, though, the, the Chattelhook photographers also depart from uh, the conventions of archaeological photography. They have a number of photos um, that certainly include the tools, the weeds, the footprints, other marks of human presence and active creation going on at the excavation. Um, but they also demonstrate a desire to create a different kind of image, ones that disrupt the expected categories of archaeological photography or even of photography in general. Um, a lot of their photos include archaeologists, but really like push them off to the side or sometimes don't include them at all. Um, they're kind of in the dark, they've got their backs to the camera, um, and so there's this whole category of photos from the Chattel Hook site workers that I think um, illustrates an, like a very literal decentering of uh, the foreign team. They're, they're, they are the subjects of the photo, but they're also kind of not. Uh, and, it, and sometimes it's kind of hard to define what the subject traditionally would be. The site worker's experience of the archaeological project is not isometric with that of the archaeological research team. Uh, I'm not trying to argue that they experience the site in the same way when I say that they have similar forms of expertise. And I think the photos speak to this reality. They illustrate preponderant similarity, but also not mimicry or duplication. I think that's clearest with the photo of the unmanned sieve uh, shown here, um, which is by a man named Mevlut who spends a lot of time at this sieve. So this is an, an example of a photo that um, truly, truly decenters the archaeologist, literally and figuratively, featuring instead uh, other subjects um, like, the, like the equipment, even equipment at rest. Um, and I recognize that there's some irony that this is the image I'm using to argue for the need to see archaeological expertise again, that it's a photo that literally doesn't even picture uh, local laborers in any way. But I think local laborers themselves have been watched closely. Their arrival times have been documented to the minute. They've been used as human scales uh, in, in, in projects for a long time. In the case of Petrie, their teeth have been examined and measured. Um, and so I think there's, there's uh, the important thing for seeing local archaeological ex expertise again is not actually looking at the local laborers themselves. Um, we're talking here at this conference about shifting grounds, which comes with this very foundational metaphor that the literal ground underneath us is shifting and changing. But I'm not sure that at least in the cases I'm examining that that has really happened, that we see shifts in the discipline, uh, but the ground on which we have built our excavations has not really changed. We have not initiated real structural change. We've started up community engagement initiatives with things like uh, celebratory 
celebratory open days and festivals, the creation of online virtual spaces for interactions between archaeologists and interested non-specialists, um, consultation with K-12 educators to produce new curricula, government advocacy, um, ensuring publications appear in the language of a host community. We've done a lot of really great work in community engagement, and I am not here to argue that any of that is not worthwhile. Um, there are also more radical examples of community archaeology that decenter the role of the archaeologist more explicitly, um, inviting descendant and indigenous and other stakeholders to lead the project to design and execution. And I'm here for all of that. I support all of those initiatives, and I'm convinced in particular that those that think about how we might lead research, uh, research projects from beginning to end in a consultative, collaborative way, I think that those are really challenging and expanding archaeological knowledge about the past. But my research suggests that even projects that have prioritized community engagement in these ways have generally not taken workers' expertise and the economic structure, the fundamental foundational economic um, uh, like infrastructure of archaeological labor as an explicit concern. And the analysis that I am conducting, I think, points to the need to do exactly that. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, I would like to say that this is very interesting and extremely important um, insight. I, I have some questions, but first I will uh, ask uh, other participants uh, if somebody has a question for Alison. Uh, I just wanted to say that as someone who's done network analysis I'm, and who has some hang-ups about it, I thought this was a really, really refreshing way of doing it, like as a narrative, uh, supportive, um, supportive way of illustrating the main point you're trying to make, and like putting, like putting that as as a as a as a um, as a way to just support the other arguments and support the stories. That was really, really insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh God, that was loud. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, really, really interesting. And obviously, it was really relevant also a couple of weeks ago in Helsinki in the context with the uh, Near Eastern archaeology, especially. I just wonder, going forward with your research, are you planning to do this kind of study in other places, other parts of the world too, to see if there's any similarities or differences in terms of the relationship between local workers or local specialists and usually foreign archaeologists that come in and, and do the work? Yeah, I, um, I toyed with the idea of, of moving to another context uh, for a little while. And then as I was finishing this research and as I was like typing up the last, uh, I don't know, words of, of, of the book where I say we need to change like the economic structures of how we do archaeology in the Middle East, um, two companies started in Jordan uh, that are trying to to kind of take back control uh, and, and, and kind of perform the work of unions, uh, protecting workers and making sure that they have the expertise that they need to work on archaeological sites through training programs, but also certifying that expertise and then being like a one-stop shop where um, excavators could come, at, like start a new project. They could, they have all the equipment, they have the, the dig house. They, so you would do like just one contract and they would take care of it all. And um, equitable treatment of workers would be built into that. Um, which is, is um, I think, a more um, like free market uh, capitalist solution than I was Im like imagining uh, to the problem. And so I'm right now in uh, year two of, of probably three or four of looking at those two companies, um, with Sila and Jordan being one of them. They were at Helsinki as well. Uh, and then Hand by Hand in Northern Jordan, I feel like I need to give them shout outs, uh, is, is the other one. And so I'm studying them for five years to see if uh, if they have the effect that they are hoping to, or whether there's kind of broader structures that need to be taken into account. Thanks, Susie. Thank you. Uh, it's Matt Edgeworth here. Yeah, that was a really great paper. Thank you. Um, this idea of the lucrative non knowledge, I just wanted to add to that that I think there's something else there too. And that is 
sometimes a kind of, um, I can only describe it as a sort of kind um, over-tolerance, maybe, of the idea of the expert. Because sometimes, as archaeologists, we're very insistent in putting across our expertness and our authority. And uh, in my experience, sometimes local communities really do know better than us. So I'm thinking of a particular example where we were showing people around a site that was meant to be a souterrain. And the or this was in the Orkneys, and the local farmers that we were showing round actually knew very well that it was a water mill, a Norse water mill, because they could have. But they were too kind to actually say so because they felt it would undermine our sense of importance and, and so on. So um, now they had nothing to gain there, so it wasn't lucrative. They were literally being kind. And of course, we eventually found, as we dug down deeper, that it was indeed a water mill. So I wondered if there was an element of that in, in these examples too, as well as the lucrative none knowledge, but it's just a, a thought. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate that um, a lot, and I think that's definitely a factor. Um, one thing that, that has been really interesting as I've started presenting this research and talking about it with people is that it seems like archaeologists, at least those who work in the Middle East, that's kind of my community, uh, seem to, to know that the local community are experts. Like when you talk to people, when I tell this story, people will be like, oh yeah, 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 we worked with this guy at the, like, the monastery and like, oh, they just, they just knew everything and they told us to move our, our trench over three meters and then, oh, it was just so good that we did. You know, they, they, they seem to recognize this and appreciate it. Um, and I think when I write, I, I'm a little bit more, um, you can go into this a little bit more, but they, I think they are hiring people who are expert intentionally, but they, they want that expertise performed and expressed, like not through a, like, an explicit lens. They want it sort of just, they want to benefit from it in general. And I'm using a general they, but, but, but I think there's this long history of, of knowing that the people that you're hiring have worked in this for decades, um, and so knowing that they, they probably do know, know better, but not wanting to hear it in a way that feels challenging or feels like, um, a, 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 like a conflict with the archaeological way of knowing. Um, and that was like those stories that I heard, I think, expressed that over and over again. Um, but I do think you're right that that has now like kind of fed back to the community too, that, uh, that there is this like respect for a scientific knowledge that they have been told time and time again that they don't have, for sure. Good afternoon. It was a pleasure to watch your, um, your work. Um, uh, I am going to ask you uh, one question, but I don't want you to feel uncomfortable, please. Uh, do you speak their language? So, no problem of, on communication. Um, in, in Turkey, the community that I work with is very rural, and so I speak yes. Turkish enough to like, communicate in Istanbul very comfortably. Um, but I did have people from that area as like additional interpreters to help understand, because people would talk in idioms a lot, like yes. how, what was it like to work at Chattelhook, and they would be like, like the barley growing in September, you know, I don't know what that means. Um, and so I, I did have people there to help with that like cultural translation, and then in, uh, in Petra I, I did the interviews myself. Yes, because um, I'm seeing them uh, and I'm seeing also our uh, small communities in Portugal. Uh, I believe they are too much tribal, as in Portugal, um, and uh, we are the invaders. So, and I believe that's your problem. So, you need to find out a way of uh, show them that you are there to help them to learn in order for them to be proud of their past. I think the best way is, uh, the, well, this is the, the way I managed to reach uh, the people that now calls me Anna normally. Morning, Anna, Anna, Anna. good afternoon, see you tomorrow, Anna. Uh, 
uh, but uh, yes, of course, it took me a few years uh, in my own country. So I believe it would be uh, it, it will be very very difficult and very stressing for you. I do believe that, and I um, wish you all the success you can get <laughs> in your in your um, approach approach to the local people. Um, so I, I was also really interested in the idea of like uh, lucrative non-knowledge, and the way I see it it, 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 it could be also defined as like learned helplessness, right? Where if you are in this kind of scenario, where you know you are paid to 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 do this job and not to really speak out about your own opinion, and that happens all. You know, in companies as well, it's 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 a widespread uh, issue. Um, but that when it when it's also combined with with knowledge that they should also have an opinion about, that can be quite dangerous, right? Because um, they they matter. They are also a a, um, a um, they are also part of part of part, should be part of the research. Um, but so, and what I was also in interested in was in the pho photography. Um, if you were to carry this on in, in the other sites around as well, and I don't know if there would be other sites, but if there are other sites in the world, what would you expect to see? Would you expect to see more of um, people taking photos, or uh, quite diverse photos, selfies, or all sorts, or would you see a more imitation, or maybe uh, uh, um, f uh, more of a close, close resemblance to an archaeologist's photography? Um, yeah, I, I, it's hard to say. I think um, I, I really am a strong believer in uh, ethnography as an important research strategy, uh, and so I, I, I'm hesitant to sort of um, speculate about places that I, I haven't worked. And I um, also to Susie's question about wanting to work elsewhere, like I do think like language is really important, and having that cultural understanding, like um, like when I'm in Jordan, I don't I don't I don't use my American. I have a name that I use that's like a Bedouin name, and I'm part of a tribe. Like it's uh, and and that that was really that's important. Uh, so I, I'm a little bit hesitant to speculate, um, and maybe as sort of like an out, <laughs> I will say that I also don't imagine that photography is equally appropriate everywhere. Like photography comes with these um, attachments, and sometimes colonial attachments, and sometimes um, spiritual beliefs around images that, that might not be appropriate everywhere. That's that's why like it was an invitation to participate to these people, and they they took it. Um, but I don't know that I don't know that photography would work. Everywhere, I do think in places, if it is taken up uh, happily, places with similar kind of labor histories, my hypothesis would be that the photos would turn out similarly. So places where this traditionally hierarchical exploitive system would work, you would get very different photos because they hadn't been invited in to like um, to archaeological ways of seeing whatsoever. Um, but I don't, I don't actually know. I think I would have to like uh, do the research to be able to find out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions for Alison? Uh, yes. Uh, if not, uh, I will make a quick question uh, before we go on because we are good with the time. Um, did you maybe ask um, people uh, how they use their gained knowledge to transfer it to the community? Not the knowledge about how to hold the tra uh, travel or how to recognize an artifact, but about the past of uh, their area, uh, 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 this site, uh, prehistory and history of uh, yeah, the, the area they live in. Yeah. Um, I, so what I, what I kept finding over and over again is that if I called it expertise, so in Arabic, the term would be khibra. If I said you you have expertise, you have khibra, they would say, oh, I don't have any khibra. I don't have expertise. I don't have it at all. Um, and so it, it becomes really hard to ask questions about how people like view their own knowledge when they deny that they even have that knowledge whatsoever. Um, so I, I don't I don't know if I have a, a great answer to that question. I will say at, at Chattelhook, 
for a long time there has been talks of kind of an explosion of tourism to the area with the inscription on the World Heritage List and um, just the long-term excavations there and the interest from foreigners. Uh, and so I think some people saw their knowledge about the site or at least their traditional life ways as being potentially like part of that develop that future development towards tourism um, but other people uh, have written about the ways in which the local community has been excluded from the development and site management process there um, and so I, I, I don't know and, and, I, and I think that's like that's actually really important to recognize that this expertise um, may or may not benefit them in, in dramatic ways um, but the argument that I make when, I, when I'm writing about this is that archaeologists have a lot to benefit from this, that we're missing out on um, important perspectives and knowledge. Um, and so I'm not doing this in the name of sort of like saving or rescuing uh, the local people. I'm actually doing it in the name of good science. I think like, like if we're just being honest about who benefits more from uh, changing our labor structures so that we're getting local perspectives, like it's definitely us. So, uh, so I, 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 yeah. So I think that that's that's um, a really important kind of ethical distinction that, like, uh, and something to be really clear about up front that, like, that that participating in this project and and contributing your expertise may or may not benefit you. But um, but here's here's why we want it, and here's um, what we're willing to pay for it. Yeah, I think I think you're completely right, and I think that. It is a good way to engage those people in communicate our messages better than ourselves, yes. because yes. we are not doing an excellent job in communicating our research to the local communities. So I think that your research is really on the right way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.